So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are delighted to proceed with the second part of today's event, uh, which will be looking at resisting the spread of China's repressive tactics and technologies. Um, before we go straight into interacting with our speakers today, um, I thought it was really remarkable to hear from all the speakers in the first session, and it perfectly illustrated a point that often comes to mind when I think about the impact of the PRC and technology, which is that it's easy to think of these technologies as simply a screen or a keyboard or something that is somehow divorced from the human experience. And what our three speakers this morning really brought to bear and really, I think, exemplified was the absolute humanity that is at risk here, that it is really people's lives who are affected by what we're talking about. And even when we discuss Seemly, seemingly esoteric issues like technology, at heart we're really talking about human freedom and human dignity. And that's something that I think absolutely has come through already in today's discussions. We're delighted today to feature three people who have spent a good deal of their experience thinking about these issues of the PRC's tactics and technologies and their impact on freedom. And so I'll briefly introduce them, but you will have their bios in your packet. Um, to my direct left is Xiao Chang, who is the founder and editor of China Digital Times, based at the University of California at Berkeley. To his left is Sophie Richardson, who is the director of the China program at Human Rights Watch here in DC. And at the end, we have TT Cat, who is a Taiwan-based civic tech activist. All three of them will have distinct perspectives and I think a great deal of knowledge to impart. We don't have that much time today, so I'll get right into it and I think we'll just have a, a conversation about some of these issues. Um, Xiao Chang, I wanted to start with you uh, because we are also thinking about the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre um, this whole week. And I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your own perspective on this and in particular, perhaps talk a little bit about your experience and how you've seen the discourse around Tiananmen change over the years since, both within China and maybe outside of China as well. How can I be short on this? <laughs> um, almost exactly 30 years ago, I was a student physics studying here at Notre Dame University, and I next day I saw the massacre on TV and I was, the day after I went back to China by myself uh, wanted to do something for my people. I started one very brief story. Uh, it was already two months later I was back to China and my, I finally connected with my family. My family was panicked that the fact that I came back at this time. They wanted me to be, stay away from Beijing as far as possible. Uh, so they sent me to, on the border of China, Korea, uh, Korean, uh, North Korean border, uh, Changbai Mountain, where my father, who is a Chinese scientist, ecologist, has an observing station uh, in, in that border. Uh, they want me to stay there for two weeks, just don't come back to Beijing again. It took me a while to get to that border of the observe station. And I woke up in the morning heard loudly on the radio, somebody radio in the next door, Voice of America. These Chinese researchers and the staff workers are there, since they're away from the city and from there, including the party secretary of the research group, were listening Voice of America in such a loud way that it woke me up in the morning. And that was late July. 1989. Technology does penetrate. That's the first thing I want to say. Uh, secondly, I want to say is that we all know, yes, today, you, or after 30 years, that you ask many, many people from China, living in China, there are some of them say we don't know, somebody say we don't remember, Somebody say they don't care, and somebody say, actually, I have changed my mind. Maybe 30 years ago was the right thing to do by the Chinese government. I heard all of that. I'm sure many of you did too, that too. Really? Is that really true? 
Chinese government don't think so. Look at the hundreds of words they are banning on the internet, filtering. Now that people not talking about June 4th, not talking about 8 times 8, not talking about May 35th, not talking about the word today, like now, tomorrow. If you search that, that kind of an internet talk shows up on the top. Therefore, they ban that search word right now. We're not talking about fire. These are the Chinese language characters. Candom. Remembrance. So don't tell me that Chinese government mistake on this. They know precisely they're still sitting on that fear. So it's not over. And technology demonstrate precisely on this. That's a, that's a terrific introduction to how we're going to be approaching things today. And Sophie, I wanted to ask you, because I know that Human Rights Watch recently published a report called China's Algorithms of Oppression, which of course goes far beyond banning terms or banning search words, and I think demonstrates some of the really both old school and cutting edge ways in which the Chinese Communist Party is applying social management techniques, particularly to the Uyghur population. Could you talk a little bit about what you found in the report? Sure. Um, I, I want to start first, though, by thanking the NED for its choice of honorees this year. Uh, Lod and Bob Dolkin, we think of you as friends, but also as exemplars, as advocates. And it's, it's an honor to work with you, and thank you for doing that. Um, well, well, to try to follow Xiao, who's a tough act, um, we just finished a project reverse engineering a police app, and perhaps sort of in keeping with what you've just said, amazingly, you know, we'd found evidence or we'd found references to a broad uh, surveillance technology that was being used across the region called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And we'd seen some chatter about it on uh, WeChat accounts used by police in the region. But then, sort of in, in, in sort of a marvelous example of what sometimes is available and what isn't, we found the app online. It was publicly available. <laughs> and we thought, really? We were a little bit surprised to find it, but we downloaded it. And we spent some time debating about whether we actually wanted to try to touch the servers and sort of reach inside it. And then we decided that was a bad idea. And so we enlisted the help of a group that's based in Berlin called Cure53 to essentially do a, a static reverse engineering. And you know, the truth is, we weren't really sure what this was going to tell us. We had set out to try to understand better who was being detained in Xinjiang and why. What did you have to have done in order to wind up being interrogated or being put in a political education camp? And what the reverse engineering ultimately told us was that all different kinds of behavior, I think we came up with 36 behavior types was the language that was used in the app, um, you know, the vast majority of which were legal, uh, were being used to determine whether somebody was actually considered suspicious. So some of the behavior types um, that the app specifically tracked, you know, the fact that the state can know these things about you, right, that this kind of information is now gathered regularly through all different forms of surveillance, you know, whether you were suddenly socializing less with your neighbors, if suddenly you were shy, we weren't quite sure exactly how that got determined, um, if you had typically gone out the back door of your house and then all of a sudden you started going out the front door of your house, that this, this information was aggregated through this app and fed into this overall surveillance system, which would then in turn identify to police in a particular area, you need to go and check out you know, Xiao's behavior because he's using a different door and we think that's suspicious. And when we were able to actually connect the use of that app to some of the cases that we'd profiled in our previous work about the establishment and the use of political education camps, I think we, were, we felt confident to say that there was a clear link between how this technology was being used and contributing to these larger violations. Uh, and I think what's, what's most alarming is first that the state can gather this kind of information without you knowing about it or being able to really resist it in any particular way but also that it, like the political education centers themselves, really has absolutely no legal basis whatsoever. And this, just to be clear, this app was something that required, it had both a technological platform, but it also had human input. Correct, correct. And one of the more interesting uh, aspects of looking at some of these WeChat uh, discussions amongst police was that they, first of all, complained bitterly about how much work it was to input and deal with this kind of data. I mean, at the end of the day, these, you know, there's 
there's a lot of human effort required, which also creates opportunities for people to resist, which is maybe something we can talk a little bit about. But also there were complaints about how the use of this technology robbed people who had been trained to provide public security. I mean, we can, we're not generally terribly sympathetic to how Chinese police are feeling on a given day, but, but it was interesting to observe that people found it objectionable that essentially their agency as professional individuals was being taken away by this technology because it told them what to go and do in the presence of certain information, and they, they couldn't not do that. So we've talked a little bit about censorship and a, and a little bit about surveillance. And TTCAT, I wanted to go to you to talk a little bit about an aspect that is linked to some of these, which is sort of the pushing out of propaganda and disinformation. As a civic tech activist and an analyst, I know you've studied the ways in which uh, the Chinese Communist Party's disinformation tactics are spreading through Taiwan's democracy, for instance. Yep. Could you, maybe you could give a little bit of background about yourself, yeah. and then also, you know, what are you seeing in this space? All right, so first of all, um, it's my honor to speak with two um, great panelists today, uh, which I really admire your work. Um, I'm an activist, campaigner, and also a coder. Started from uh, 2004. I, um, in Taiwan, L uh, I participate for LGBT movement, human rights movement, and democracy. So last past three years, I worked for this uh, civic tech community um, for open government through open data. Um, we connect the tech community with the social uh, civil society organization and uh, build a tour for civil society organization. So. Um, before we get into this uh, like issue, what happened in Taiwan, I just want to echo uh, the previous panelists talking about identity. So, um, the China did a lot of uh, things trying to in eliminate Taiwan's identity um, from outside or within. So, uh, last year they called for um, 44 international uh, Airlines company to try to change the Taiwan a uh, Taipei Airport as a Taipei China. So um, that's a huge um, uh, misunderstood for a lot of uh, foreigners who don't understand Taiwan situation. So if you want to travel to Taiwan, don't apply visa from China government. That's a notice here. Um, right. So. Um, Actually, a lot of uh, people try, uh, especially from U.S., U.S., um, there's a global um, um, education centers come uh, to Taiwan to want to understand how China spread their propaganda and disinformation in Taiwan, right? But uh, very little uh, people really understand how those ch channel, how, what kind of channel they use, and uh, through the WeChat or Line group, because it, some message inside the messenger app. And then not like on, um, in U.S. or other place, we don't use Twitter that often. We use Facebook, and the Facebook could tend to close. Um, you know, after the scandal um, last year, they being very close right now. So you you, you can probably not do um, comprehensive analyze about all those messages, where they come from, and how to um, how they spread um, and mapping. But um, um, this civic tech community I worked with before, it, they, they did develop this like a chat body uh, in LINE. LINE is an uh, instant messenger app, app, very popular in Taiwan, Thailand, and some Asia places. So they developed this chat bot. So if you get this any message, you can forward to the chat bot, and then the chat bot will re respond to you whether or not uh, it's a fake news. So it's a open um, database like Wikipedia. Everybody can become an editor. And it's a more easy way for elder people or for the people who don't uh, familiar with the uh, internet. Um, they don't know how to Google um, and do the fact check by themselves. They can use in this uh, chatbot. So this chatbot engage more than 100,000 users right now. So we get a lot of messages from the chatbot, right? Then we can do analyze about um, how often we see one single message be reported by users we engage. And uh, also um, how many um, time this message survive um, within this like uh, different chat group. And then um, 
there's a new um, program is coming up to want to look at a loads message from this open database and see more if we can find out where um, the China narrative or um, where is their uh, influence message align with their uh, unified front uh, um, tactics, right? And there seem to be a lot of similarities there between the ways that disinformation propagates through Taiwanese democracy and the ways that other authoritarian disinformation spreads through other countries. So I'll come back to that in a second. But let me turn back to you, Xiao Chang, because um, you know, Sophie had mentioned that in this app that they had taken apart and analyzed, that was a combination of human input and um, you know, machine learning, essentially, and an aggregation of databases. In a recent article that you wrote for the Journal of Democracy called President Xi's Surveillance State, you go into great detail about the ways in which, particularly with respect to surveillance, um, things have advanced much farther than we may have thought possible even a few years ago. And you discuss issues like face recognition, voice recognition, even DNA recognition. Could you talk a little bit about some of those trends and you know, what are we seeing now and what do we see on the horizon? Um, maybe you also remember that until three years ago, I was still has been very passionately advocating on the uh, side of technology, on the liber liberation side of the communication technology and internet the digital promise we already we all had and the hope we had empowering the ordinary people the uh, uh, the free freer flow of information the uh, connected uh, uh, more connectivities and and, and uh, emergence of a new form of collective action that happened in China uh, uh, over the last decade and I've been observing them. Um, and of course I had great hope for that will transform the Chinese society for the more freer and more humane. Um, but the fact I observe, and the data shows in my research tells me that the Chinese authority has, since Xi Jinping stepped in power, particularly, particularly because he realized the vulnerability of the regime under this technology, he stepped up tremendously the effort of control uh, uh, and manipulate and the repression of the internet and public opinion. To my surprise, successfully until so far. Why? In addition to the desperation of the regime and, and the resource of the regime is put there. What I also know now is from my own, my, my uh, university working with other colleagues and, 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 and I understand the potential of technology now has turned. It's not only empowering individual users, it's actually the new generation technology mentioned the field, right? The, particularly the artificial intelligence empowered the big data analysis. And this so the data driven surveillance capitalism now is fused with the one-party dictatorship becoming what I call the digital totalitarian state. China is well on that road. And the things that the, uh, um, Shanti just mentioned, facial recognition, uh, voice recognition, DNA collection, are actually happening in China. It's not this utopian film. It's actually happening in China, in Xinjiang particular, but it's more than Xinjiang, it's spreading out of China more and more. China's government is really on this way. And the technology helps the individual user has no power but surrender their behavior data every day, every single move using WeChat, for one thing, Alipay. Yes. And the corporate or Chinese private co corporation is not really private, right? They, 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 and the state has full access all this data and the potential of the technology can, some of them not quite there yet, such as machine learning for social credit systems. They want it to. They will get there. They, they, but the whole plan is there. And with this new awesome power of technology, of surveillance, maybe this authoritarian regime can really last longer than what we hoped. And this really deeply concerns me. 
I still have the hope that ultimately people will prevail, the desire for freedom will prevail, and technology, some of the technology aspect will help. But right now, we're not in that phase of the history. We're in the face of the technology threatening the human existential freedom in China, as a matter of fact, throughout the world. I mean, when, uh, you and I have both looked at the issues of internet in China for a long time, and I know back in the early days, people used to talk about a cat and mouse game. Um, but primarily talking about trying to get around censorship, and these days it sounds as though you're saying the cat has gotten much, much, much bigger and more well equipped. And if you think about ordinary people as the mice trying to get around some of these mechanisms, it's one thing to get around censorship. It's another thing to get around an entire apparatus that is able to essentially predict your behavior or um, you know, cut off avenues of dissent even before they arise. And induce your behavior towards the, what state wants to construct. And think of how many cameras right there. Think of China as a leading technology that on um, facial recognition and artificial intelligence. And just using one short word, I used to focus on censorship on internet. But now the issue is censorship by internet throughout the space, entire space. So you mentioned the companies that are developing, developing some of this technology. And Sophie, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see the role of the private sector in building out some of these technologies not just within China, but obviously coming from outside China as well. Um, you know, how do you then shine a spotlight on that, and how do you induce behavior on the part of the private sector that won't enable these kinds of practices? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, maybe I'll say a few words about our, our, our work around a company that's based in Massachusetts called Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, when we started writing about uh, the compulsory collection of biodata across Xinjiang a couple of years ago. You know, one of the ways that a lot of us have done work to find information and evidence about what's happening in that, that region has involved looking at police tenders or, or you know, bids for government services that are available online. And that was how we came to understand that at a time when, Xinjiang, when the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau was gathering this kind of data about people, this particular company had sold uh, a, a quite a large number of, or an unusual number of DNA sequencers to the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau. Now, I want to be very clear that we were never able to show definitively that that company's sequencers were used in sequencing the DNA of these particular people, but you know it was clearly a coercive environment in which massive human rights violations were taking place. You know, let's recall that the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights you know, at a minimum, you know, oblige companies or strongly encourage them to have a due diligence strategy in place that they have to follow to ensure that their business operations aren't enabling or contributing to serious human rights violations. So we wrote to this company and said, we see that you've made these sales to this police force. Here's what we know is going on in this region, particularly with respect to the kinds of, of issues that your technology could be used for. What do you say? And what's your due diligence strategy? And suffice it to say that after a couple of exchanges of letters and months went by, we still really hadn't gotten a satisfactory answer to any of the questions that we had put to this company, at which point we enlisted the support of some congressional offices, particularly Senator Rubio's office. Um, and they then took these issues up with the company and didn't really get a terribly satisfactory reply either, at which point we uh, enlisted the support of the New York Times, which wrote a piece that everybody should read because it's, it's terrifying and it's blood curdling. And it was in the face of the publication of that piece that Thermo Fisher finally said, we will no longer sell that particular technology in Xinjiang. You know, <laughs> not a bad half step, but what else are you selling in Xinjiang? What are you selling in other parts of China? What is your due diligence strategy to this day? I mean, it's probably been about two years-ish, I'd have to look, since we first wrote to them. We still don't have an answer to that question. And ain't nobody should be doing business in Xinjiang right now who cannot answer that question. Because as Xiao said, you know, there aren't private interests in China. And you know, the state permeates lots of different realms of, of life there and in other parts of the country. And it's, I think it's very hard to draw a fine line and say, 
we're only selling for corporate purposes or we're only selling for research purposes or we're only <laughs> selling for you know, this narrow commercial interest. I think companies have to answer a lot of tough questions about their operations. Uh, and then just to flip it around a little bit, the, the company that's most implicated in the report that we just wrote is a very large Chinese conglomerate called China, it's CETC, China Electronics Telecommunications Corporation, uh, which owns lots of subsidiaries that are involved in different aspects of surveillance technology. It has already been the subject of some sanctions by the US, but you know there, there are plenty of companies from the mainland to look at. There are plenty of companies from other parts of the world that are doing business in China in this space that I think have to answer for exactly what they're doing. Well, companies are one thing, but um, one, of, one of the things that was pointed out in the New York Times article was the presumption on the part of universities who are aiding in research that um, they simply thought that all people were um, had full consent, essentially. They assumed that anybody that was contributing to a genetic database that would be used were consenting willfully, essentially thinking, well, of course, everyone has the same rule of law. Um, protections everywhere that we do. And I know that you also have recently engaged on the subject of what universities can do to, to make sure they, and of course their mission is different from that of the private sector. In many cases, they, as part of their founding statements, they, they, they commit to not doing these sorts of things. So what have you put out recently that might get to some of these issues? Yeah, we, in March we published a code of conduct uh, for universities around the world to protect academic freedom from Chinese government pressure. And many of you will have read stories about things like Confucius Institutes or about you know, speakers representing the, the Tibetan and Uyghur communities getting harassed when they give talks on campuses uh, by, uh, by other students. Uh, you know, what we were trying to do was reinforce the idea to universities that many of their existing codes of conduct or honor codes you know, are very well, or were designed to deal with things like cheating or plagiarism or tenure or sexual harassment issues like that, almost we have yet to find an existing university code of conduct that imagines these kinds of surveillance, harassment, self-censorship. So we were trying to make suggestions to schools about how they could resist those kinds of pressures. But we did also include language to say that, stu that schools need to be uh, transparent and honest and I think a lot more careful about who they're taking money from, whether it's different parts of the Chinese government or whether it is problematic Chinese companies that are looking to you know, give money, I think, for a variety of different reasons, whether it's that they want access to certain kinds of research collaborations, whether they're looking for a little reputation laundering opportunities. You know, universities are big businesses, and they too have obligations both as businesses but also as defenders of academic freedom. And, and I think they're very blinkered on this topic. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons, we chose not to name the schools at which we had done interviews for this project, partly because there were just, there were over a hundred of them. The positive net effect is that when we published the Code of Conduct, a lot of uh, uh, university administrators, some from schools who had previously not been willing to talk to us when we were doing the research, called us and said, are you talking about us? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of work for universities to do as well in, in making sure that they're not part of the problem. Some of, this, some of what we're talking about, it's been written about in major news outlets. You know, we certainly have talked a lot about all this data that's coming out, and it seems as though it would be a relatively easy thing to simply get the right information out there, let that circulate, and that should counter any counter narratives and so on. But TTCAT, I know you've talked about in your analysis of disinformation, sometimes just fact checking isn't enough. And I was wondering if you could go into that a little bit more. Okay, so um, um, there's a very trendy word that's happened uh, in Taiwan right now, it's called information war. Uh, information warfare. It's not new, um, but the people starting uh, where uh, that's happening right now because due to the election last year, there's um, like there's a like referendum, seven million people against LGBT, and there's a, a lot of a, um, KMT or poor China candidates uh, be elected. So now people are very worried about the next election, which is the next January. So people are talking about the information warfare, but um, but actually um, the there are some researchers, but not. Um, 
not m as many as it should be. And um, they are trying to find the real evidence, which is very hard. Um, then, but they wanted to aware other people who still don't know there's a uh, China influence or they they buying the media or they buying this like a local agent to try to spread their uh, narrative. Um, but when they trying to um, 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 telling other people, it spread the fear. And the general public or civil society organization, they don't actually have an action plan or counter activities to um, to deal with that uh, or show the real evidence who is uh, actually taking the money from the, uh, China. We only have a few right now. So um, if you go back to see the purpose of the information warfare, what they're trying to do actually is uh, to divide your society. They don't actually care who gets elected actually. They want to divide your society and uh, tell you that you see, democracy is a chaos and is an inefficiency. It's um, not working, it's a, a lot of a fight, right? So um, they try to undermine your um, demac uh, democracy value. So um, what we're trying to do is that um, one, in the one hand, we need more technology, open technology, civic tech for democracy and human rights to finding the evidence to map in the channel to tell the people who actually uh, are the local agent for uh, foreign regime. But on the other hand, we also need to develop the social um, innovative techno um, techies to um, communicate with the people who feel unheard, who feel disconnected, who feel distrust the um, government. So if we only use the fact check result to um, talk to them, to argue their argument, um, they wouldn't believe um, your point. You're just pushing their aware, uh, uh, away. So I think um, people from United States are very familiar with this. And uh, we are um, looking for to um, start we are like very well behind right now. We need to um, start doing this. Um, that's why I talk. Why? Yeah. And there are s many similarities there. I think it's interesting that many people think that the Chinese party state is only concerned about uh, suppressing, essentially censoring certain topics. But what you've described is very similar to what you might see the Kremlin doing in many countries, sort of trying to sow doubt in democracy itself, which is an interesting wrinkle. Xiaocheng, I wanted to ask you, and we'll have to wrap up pretty soon, but I, I wanted to get your sense on why all these issues are relevant outside of China. You know, we've talked a lot about the ways that these are developing both in Xinjiang and then outside more broadly in China, but increasingly there is, you alluded to this, sort of a worry that some of these, some of these tactics and technologies might also be present in other places, especially along countries of the Belt Road, maybe even farther afield if technologies are influenced by norms that maybe are being crafted within the UN, within other institutional um, settings where the CCP is able to exert influence. And so I thought, I was hoping you could just at least start that off. Yeah, I actually want to share a conversation with, uh, with a German diplomat yesterday. I was in Berlin. <coughs> that talking about exactly the same issue, the Chinese uh, uh, surveillance technology spread out the world, Huawei particularly. She said this to me, that we know clearly, German government, we know that uh, <coughs> the nature of the Chinese regime. But the authoritarian regimes usually are weak. Venezuela, North uh, uh, Korea, Cuba. But China is powerful. This is a powerful authoritarian regime. Now, economically and geopolitically expanding in the world. So, that is the issue. And this also, the powerful authoritarian regime taking advantage of the open society, the democratic 
and diversity of the, you know, the voices and democratic system and rule of law and freedom of expression to their own strategic advantage to advance their interest, which fundamentally undermine the value of our society and eroding our society. Those technologies doesn't really stay in China because <coughs> the Chinese companies are expanding around the world. Because a political system that's domestically oppressive will definitely be coming internationally imperial <coughs> and dominating and using, look at the one by one road. They're not only exporting China's laborers and building infrastructure, uh, building uh, a port, uh, building an, an, an port. They're also providing digital infrastructure, 5G, surveillance technology under the name of smart city, particular component called safe city. And all these technologies are going to sprout the world. But once any country, any society, your core communication infrastructure are being under the companies of the authoritarian regime like China, then you are greatly endangered the value and the national security of UN society, that United States included. So uh, this is why it's so important for us to address this issue. And it's not, as you allude to, it's not just a problem of the Chinese government exporting this technology to other like-minded regimes, for instance. There's sometimes a perception that it's just going from authoritarians to authoritarians, but you're implying this is something that democracies yes. and societies in between, everyone has to think about and grapple with. Yes, and they're facing it. They are facing the issue right now. Sophie, I was hoping that we could maybe conclude on a bit of a um, positive note by thinking about the ways in which civil society might be able to not simply be on the defensive, but think about how you would really make a difference in this environment. And because Human Rights Watch has had such heavy hitting reports and you know, you've been thinking about the ways to conduct advocacy around this for a long time, you know, what, what are some of the things that civil society, not just in the US, but around the world can think about doing? I'm not sure why this question is coming to me since I'm not necessarily known for my optimism. <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, I, I mean, you know, these guys have just offered up important observations about, you know, innovating with technology and making citizens more aware and empowered. Uh, you know, we can go all the way through the spectrum of, you know, things like sanctions against companies that are problematic. But let's also not lose sight of the fact, you know, that, for example, if there is some resistance inside China, to you know, being turned into you know data entry machines that people don't like that that creates a little bit of room. You know, people may resist doing that a little bit in in ways that are you know sort of think about Jim Scott you know weapons of the week right that that people resist having to do those sorts of work that you know people are finding ways to innovate around restrictions or try to live outside certain kinds of constraints. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done by people in our communities in explaining what the risks are. But I think once those are understood, it's not very hard to see a response. You know, and whether that's you know very high octane debates about you know whether a country should sign on to have Huawei or really what the risks are. I think the awareness uh, about what the potential for abuses are gets commensurately higher, not just in whatever the other country is but about what the realities people are grappling with inside China are. And, and you know, that awareness is not a bad thing. And Titi Kat, just to finish up our conversation on technology, I was hoping you also, given your experience, and I, I sense that you are, you do have a, a hopefulness and an optimism about technology coming out of the civic tech community. What, what are the ways in which technology can be used to really strengthen democratic resilience in your view? Well, um, when we describe this word civic tech, I've been um, worked with them and uh, observed this like international, international civic tech um, network happening in past three or five years around the world. So um, the, the center of the civic tech, I would say, is uh, open source, it's uh, open to people. So it's like technology, but the um, uh, uh, people own the technology. So um, I'm really encouraged uh, all these like uh, 
uh, traditional democracy network, um, traditional civil society reach out to those open source technologists because um, you know inside it is open source c uh, community they ca they do care about the like, internet freedom it's um like inside their DNA so uh, we've been uh, facilitating this like a dialogue exchange between uh, NGO and uh, uh, technology digital security and also uh, activists in the uh, risk environment um, and it worked very well and the people start to learn how to work with each other and uh, developing the new technology and the tools for uh, for all that so um, in the well uh, in the end I think it's not well civic tech is a two part right tech and the civic so um, we we cannot also uh, uh, forget the social part we have to build in this social part inside the tech community and the tool that's how it might work yeah terrific Hey, well, Shanti, one last yeah. thought. I mean, mm -hmm. What about we start a coalition, an international coalition of NGOs on things like global privacy rights, right? Let's let's get out there and set some international standards that we can all, you know, point to, you know, to criticize policies, but promote promote better ones and share around the knowledge about technology. That's something we could all commit to doing. I think sounds like yes. a great idea. So you heard it here first from Sophie <laughs> and. Uh, I think that's a great note. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's a great note to end on, though, and we, we all should remember there are things, there's space to do plenty yeah. here. So um, I hope you'll join me in thanking this fantastic panel, Xiao Chang, Sophie, and Titi Kat. Thank you so much. <laughs>